Good evening, everyone. Very nice to see so many of you. Welcome to Blackfriars. Welcome to our first Thomistic Institute lecture of 2024. We celebrated this morning in the Priory the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, translated from yesterday. And some of you might be wondering why we're commemorating St. Thomas Aquinas with a lecture on St. Isaac of Nineveh. Now, in truth, this date wasn't actually in mind when we planned the lecture, but St. Thomas did say at the end of his life that all my work is but straw. And so in a sense, we're honoring St. Thomas by passing over his intellectual achievements in favor of his greater achievements in sanctity. So I also learned yesterday the two do in fact share a feast day, the 28th of January, yesterday. So it's all very providential, and I'm sure St. Thomas will be pleased with expanding, broadening our theological horizons this evening. Our broad theme for the term at Blackfriars in our, in our reading group and our lectures is philosophical and theological anthropology. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? And this evening we turn to the great, the rich tradition of East Syriac mysticism. I'm sure it will be new to many of you this evening, and I hope there's a great amount you take away from it. And tonight we're going to look at one of East Syriac mysticism's most celebrated figures, St. Isaac of Nineveh. And it's a huge privilege and joy to be able, able to welcome Dr. Valentina Duca, who has an immense expertise on St. Isaac and a great passion for his thought, not just for its historical interests, but for its relevance for contemporary questions too. Dr. Duca is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department for Comparative Religion at, the, at Religion at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She completed her MPhil and her DPhil here in Oxford before spending two years at the Catholic University of Leuven. Her current work includes producing a critical edition of some unedited writings of Isaac and an analysis of the concept of experience in East Syriac mysticism. The title of her lecture this evening is Exploring Finitude, Weakness, Suffering and Faith in Isaac of Nineveh. Thank you very much, Dr. Duke. Thanks very much, Brother John, and uh, thanks to Blackfriars, and thanks to the Thomistic Institute for this wonderful opportunity to talk here. Thanks to all of you. I see many young people. It's a real pleasure to see people interested in uh, spiritual themes, uh, theological themes, all gathered here. Um, it's a pleasure also for me to be here at Oxford University for several reasons. The first is that it was here that in uh, 1983, Sebastian Brock, discovered an important part of Isaac's writings, and this created a new interest in Isaac's uh, corpus, in Isaac's thought. A lot of publications are born from this, and so for me, it's a honor to be here. But it's a honor also because Syriac studies have been cultivated in this, un this university uh, for a long time. It's one of the few places in Europe or in the European space where this is done. So here we have a great opportunity to uh, learn this culture and uh, the language. And I had the privilege to study here with uh, Professor David Taylor. It was a great honor, a great professor who respectful of uh, the research of the student and uh, able to guide us through the texts. And uh, it is through the text also that I want to uh, journey with you today. So in the handout, you find several quotations of Isaac that I translated. You find also the Syriac. Not many of you uh, will be able to read the Syriac, but maybe this is a um, suggestion, let's say, for further study. And at the end, you find the primary sources in English, both editions and translations, recent translation of uh, the headings on spiritual knowledge of uh, Sebastian Brock is there too, very recent, 2022. And then we have a few studies of secondary literature on Isaac. So today we are uh, uh, talking of Isaac the Syrian. I don't know how familiar you are with Isaac. Isaac was a solitary monk. He lived in the seventh century. Um, he was for a short moment, a bishop of Nineveh. Um, due to the effort of the Catholicos, George I. But he was uh, born in 
current, but in current Qatar, let's say your Bet Qatraye, the region of the Gulf, and he belonged to the Church of the East. The Church of the East is this branch of Syria Christianity, which was uh, um, in the Persian Empire, so Mesopotamia, Iran, but it expanded down to the Gulf region and also had a missionary expansion towards Central Asia and uh, China and uh, India. Uh, but it was a minoritarian church, so it has never been an imperial church. Before, it was uh, uh, the majority of the people were Zoroastrians, and then after the fall of the Sasanian Empire in 651, we have Islam gradually taking uh, over. And so it's a church which has always been marginal in a way, although communities were thriving. Marginal at least from a more Western or Greek perspective on Christianity. And uh, nevertheless, it was a church in which in the 7th and 8th century, there was a blossoming of uh, um, ascetic mystical writings. In particular, we have Isaac of Nineveh, but we also, Isaac is of course uh, the main exponent of this movement, but we also have uh, Dadisho Katraya, and we have Simon of Taibute, always in the 7th century. And in the 8th century, we have John of Daliata and Joseph of Zaya. These uh, two mystics were condemned by a synod, by the Catholic host Timothy I, but uh, the successor rehabilitated them and their writings became central for the Syriac spiritual tradition. So the, it's not only Isaac the Syrian, but it's a kind of a universe, a spiritual uh, sensibility, if we want. Um, this church, this is important to uh, bear in mind, has been labeled as Nestorian for a long time because it did not accept Ephesus and Chalcedon. But, uh, of course, this label is quite misleading. We have to bear in mind that the main theologian for them was more than Nestorius Theodor of Mopsuestia. And Theodor of Mopsuestia uh, is central also for Isaac. We will see a special perspective of Theodor that uh, uh, Isaac inherits. Um, but together with Theodore, we have other influences in Isaac, especially Evagrius Ponticus. So <laughs> if you want, Evagrius inherits the, uh, the tradition of origin. So we have Theodore, Antiochian, and a more, let's say, Alexandrian line of thought. Although uh, the main line of thought in Isaac's church is Antiochian, but we have Evagrius. And Evagrius is a teacher of the spiritual life, a teacher of the ascetic mystical path for them. Then we have John the Solitary. He's a great author, only in part edited, uh, autochthonous from uh, the Syriac uh, area, writing in Syriac. And then we have several other influences. Pseudo Dionysius, we have Mark the Monk, Abba Isaiah, Palladius with the Historia Lausiaca, the Ap of Thames. So we see Isaac was inheriting a huge, a big culture. And nevertheless, his writings is no directly theoretical or directly theological, but it is experiential. So the interest of Isaac is mostly in the journey of the human being, in the dynamics of the inner experience, in what Benedict might call querere deum. So that's what he's interested in. And he writes for disciples who share the same uh, interest. But we have to bear in mind that he does this coming from this background of uh, a wide culture. So not only feeling, but really also thought. And although he is unsystematic in a way, his thought is extremely coherent. To come back to his uh, uh, life and to his writings, so Isaac became a bishop of Nineveh, but after five months he renounced and he went to live on the mountains of Kuzisan in southwestern Iran where he shared the life of monks of the region. It was a semi-eremitical life, so it was not a Cenobitic life, but it was not a life of complete isolation. And he had disciples. We know that his writings were written for disciples. So they have a kind of a dialogic tone, right? He often speaks to his beloved, or he speaks of fathers he goes to meet. So it's extremely dynamic. And uh, what do we have of Isaac today? So we have the first part, 82 discourses, 
And this was very important because it was translated into Greek in the end of the 8th, beginning of 9th century in Mar Saba, a monastery near Jerusalem. And from there it passed to Orthodox Christianity so that Isaac became a foundational author for Hezekiah. And from there he passed into Slavic, so Paleo-Slavic and then the Slavic languages, and became an essential reference also in the Russian culture. And we have up to an influence which is not only monastic circles, but uh, also, for instance, and especially in Dostoevsky, in the Brothers Karamazov, the figure of the Starek uh, Zosima, but also other ideas expressed in the novel, really comes from Isaac. Uh, from this Greek translation, there were translations also in other languages, and one is Latin. Of course, in the Latin West, uh, Isaac was not as influential as in the East, Syriac and Greek, but it had an influence. So 50 discourses of the first part were translated into Latin, and they were very much appreciated in the milieus of the spiritual Franciscans, but also Dominicans, I recently discovered new of Isaac, and other religious orders. His figure merged with uh, a figure of uh, Syriac Isaac, who lived near Spoleto and founded an eremitic colony there, and uh, Isaac of Montelucco. And um, the person who speaks of this Isaac, so not our Isaac, but this Isaac, is Gregory the Great in the dialogues. These two figures merged, and therefore Isaac became a reference also in the West. Uh, and an interesting point, uh, this is interesting for contemporary research, is that Turnaisen, a theologian who was a friend of Karl Barth, he was uh, a lover and a scholar of Dostoevsky, and he highlights especially passages of Dostoevsky where there is an influence of Isaac. So an, an Italian scholar, Salvestroni, she's a scholar of Dostoevsky, hypothesized that Isaac had an influence also on Barth. Of course, it's indirect, very indirect, so we can doubt about it, but it's interesting to think uh, the way his thoughts uh, is transmitted. But today we are going uh, to talk about finitude. So finitude is a specific way Isaac has to speak of anthropology, which is the theme of the Atomistic Institute for this year. So the reflection on uh, anthropology and uh, therefore on uh, creatural finitude is the central in Isaac. And we can also uh, say that uh, the quest for God itself is uh, rooted into um, his reflection on anthropology. So the quest for God, we will see, is rooted in questions which emerge from a quest which is related to the condition of the human. So when we say that today we do a theological study of Isaac, it is true, but it's not an abstract theology, but the theology whose questioning about God is born from experience. This is very important for me to uh, to highlight. And in this sense, it has also an universal significance which goes beyond, beyond boundaries, uh, as actually happened also through history, as, uh, as we can see. Uh, I want to explore this theme in three steps. So the first is to understand how Isaac conceives the human condition. The second is uh, what is what Isaac calls weakness, Syriac mechiluta. It's a technical term in his uh, corpus, very important. And I want to explore with you what it means. And then I want to uh, see uh, how Isaac outlines a process of relationship with weakness and what this has to do with the birth of a certain approach to faith and to human radical solidarity. Um, so to see how the relationship with oneself, with one's weakness and finitude, uh, what this has to do uh, with the vertical dimension, so the relationship with God and the horizontal dimension, the relationship with other creatures, uh, human beings, and we will see other creatures. So we have first to keep in mind that uh, for Isaac, the world in which the human being lives, it's extremely uh, limited. Let's read together the first passage. I, uh, God made your nature a receptacle of accidents, and in the world in which he created and left you, he multiplied the, co the causes of accidents and trials. He made your nature a small receptacle for these things. Evils are not far from you, not very far at all. They sprout from within you at this sign, 
and from below your feet and from the place where you are. As the upper eyelid is close to the lower eyelid, so trials are close to human beings. So actually, our condition in the world, it's a condition of subjection to trials and difficulties, and God did not make us impassable, and God didn't make us not subject to inclination. We will examine the, this concept uh, in a while. And uh, this condition of limitation, what is the first place of the perception of this condition is the body. Because the body is part of the world, so the body also is mutable, is corruptible. And so the reflection of Isaac of mortality becomes primary. Because our condition is a condition which will end, in a way, at least in the physical body. Um, we can see um, from the second quotation how Isaac is sensible also to the suffering of the body. We have several passages on illness in his writings, and we see, for instance, this. It's a prayer for those who suffer from harsh illnesses and grievous infirmities of the body. Send them an angel of compassion and suit their soul, which are tormented by the vehement afflictions of their body. But the problem of uh, um, finitude is not only a problem of suffering, but it's also related to the problem of sin. Let's see how. In the quotation that follows, we have a peculiar idea of Isaac that I want to examine with you. We did not become mortal because we sinned, but because we were mortal, we were pushed to sin. Some of you might have in mind Romans 5.12 of Paul, where it is said that uh, uh, it is uh, from sin that death came. But Isaac here is saying something else. Of course, it's not uh, in order to contradict Paul that is one of the main sources in Isaac, so this is not his intention. But he wants to focus on the fact that it is an ontological problem, the problem of our limitation, of our radical finitude, that leads us to defensive reactions against this problem, which lead to sin. And these defensive reactions for him are the passions. In the monastic uh, discussion of sin, the origin of sin is related to the passions, uh, greed, uh, um, um, uh, envy, uh, pride, these kind of things that then became also the, the, the vices no? in, in the West. But or in the original reflection of uh, uh, Evagrius Ponticus, uh, these are eight original thoughts which lead to passion. If you listen to the thought, you will uh, follow a passion. And if you follow a passion, you will fall into sin. That's uh, the idea. So for Isaac, these uh, passions are um, caused by our fear of our finitude and mortality. And this is also fear of suffering, as uh, he says in another quotation. One of the saints said, the body becomes a companion of pain because it fears afflictions of being tormented and dying to its life. So actually, uh, this uh, conception comes from Theodor of Mopsuestia. Theodor, Theodor has two ways of conceiving the problem. One is the traditional one, from sin that came, and the other is this one. And Isaac openly and, uh, and uh, with fervor, we can say, supports this uh, second view. Um, but it is not only the body to be limited, but also the soul. We found the word inclination before. This is an Antiochian context, um, an Antiochian concept that indicates free will, so the capacity to incline on one uh, side or uh, to the other side. But uh, for Isaac, it's also a kind of, uh, um, how can I say, uh, tendency to error. So to incline in the sense that you, it's a possibility of fall, of fall, so you can fall. And that's inclination, and for Isaac, it's distinctive of the soul. And another aspect of limitation of the soul, which is ontological, is that after death, the soul will sleep. This, this is a conception distinctive of his church. So the soul will sleep until God, with his uh, powerful and omnipotent hint, will awaken the soul in the final resurrection. So in a way, this idea highlights once more the creatural nature of the soul. And then there is the other problem of the soul, which is uh, uh, subjection to passionality. And subjection to uh, passionality, we have seen how, uh, how, it, uh, how it is born. 
And what I want to highlight uh, concerning this idea is that Isaac, uh, with this idea, proposes a precedence of the negative, we could say, in the sense that at the origin of human experience, so at the origin of creation in Adam, but therefore in all of us, there is an element of imperfection, of uh, incompleteness, an aporetic element, if you want, and therefore the problem also of the moral fall, the problem of sin, is not only moral, but primarily it is rooted in a certain way of dealing with an ontological problem. In fact, we have seen in the second uh, quotation that the problem is fear of mortality. It's not mortality per se. The creature has fear to suffer, has fear to die. And uh, highlighting the problem of fear means highlighting that the problem is not mortality or suffering per se, but the problem is our relationship with it. And I believe this is extremely modern. So um, it means there can be uh, the possibility of a different relationship with these with these elements. And this is precisely what the solitary in his journey look for. So a different relationship with uh, the conditions of uh, uh, limitation and, uh, uh, and finitude. And this is made possible by the fact that Isaac conceives, following the tradition of John the Solitary, the soul as non-passional. So there is a core of the self which is not, which can be free of passions. Uh, Isaac, um, in fact, thinks that uh, this uh, inner non-passional um, core of the self can be in relationship with other elements of the self the thoughts we have mentioned before, the passions, and through this exercise of relationship can become strong and free from these influences. We can read, for instance, the, some passages which indicate this relational uh, movement of the soul. Observe yourself continuously, my beloved. Enter within yourself continuously. Which of the passions do you see to have grown feeble in your presence? And again, the solitary should always remain before God's presence if he wants to seize quickly the small points which throb in him and to learn to discern in the peace of mind the thoughts which enter and go out. So you can see how he outlines the dialectic between, let's say, a subjective pole of the self and an objective pole of the self. We will see how this is important also in the transformative uh, journey of Ascesis that we will examine in a while. Um, we have seen then, then the condition of uh, the body and the soul, it's limitation. And uh, facing, when the subject faces this limitation, the first movement is the attempt to transcend this condition. And for Isaac, this desire is justified because God himself is conceived as a consolation of suffering, a liberation from suffering. Let's read this beautiful passage. Uh, where Isaac says, all will receive fulfillment when our Lord will rise from heaven above all, and he will raise us from the dust, and will give renewal and liberation from suffering to us and to the whole of creation, and will make all ascend with him to the heavenly realm. So the movement of faith is not a movement which is only mental. We will see it uh, also at the end. So uh, adhering to uh, a confession of faith, but is a movement of trust in a God who is conceived as liberating from suffering. And nevertheless, Isaac has a strong awareness that this liberation is not possible on earth. And so we find in his uh, corpus this kind of sentences, since human nature has not yet been raised above the order of mortality and the weight of the flesh, it cannot be completely in that spiritual state which is above inclination. The provocations of the passions do not cease until the world exists. There is no perfect freedom, in fact, he writes, in an imperfect world. So we can see between these two poles, his reflection unfolds. Um, and it is precisely um, at this point that the concept of weakness emerges. Weakness in Syriac is mohiluta, but Isaac also uses several other terms that you can find on the second page of the handout. 
Um, so weakness actually for Isaac uh, um, should not be understood uh, as we speak sometimes for this team in a contemporary uh, common discourse, let's say, where we say we have to accept our weaknesses in the plural. So for him, weakness is an ontological condition and is the condition of exposure to suffering and death that is distinctive of human beings. So it, it's not easy to accept that, imagine. So it's something which creates a problem. You can reach the point of accepting, but it's not as easy as we might imagine uh, following common discourse. And on the other hand, we also have not to think that weakness is only moral. So like a moral failure or the weakness of the creature, um, uh, the moral weakness of the creature, for instance, uh, um, when uh, uh, grace instead fulfills this uh, weakness. This is an aspect of weakness, but it's not the only one, because we have seen there is an exposure to suffering of the body, an exposure to mortality. So it's something ontological, and the moral problem is born within this wider ontological context. And I have to mention here that the first person to uh, talk of this problem of weakness was Andre Louvre. Some of you might have uh, might know Andre Louvre. He was a Trappist monk, and he also translated uh, part of Isaac Rattis into French. He spoke a lot of weakness uh, within his uh, works, um, and also um, shed some light on this concept on Isaac in Isaac, and also Sabino Fiala, the editor of um, the third part. Um, highlighted how this uh, this term this term and uh, this concept is uh, central in Isaac, uh, but I want to focus with you um, on a passage from the centuries of knowledge where we can see how weakness is discovered. Isaac is speaking of the martyrs, and the martyrs were made insensible due to the power of God, which who is the Holy Spirit here. So the power of God was making these people insensible to their suffering, the suffering of the soul, but also the suffering of the body. But something happens at a certain point. Let's see. Some of the martyrs were seeing this power in a perceptible way. And at the time of the vehemence of the torments, it was appearing openly to many of them. Many times also, the suffering of the body was taken away from them, as one of them said, as every limb was torn asunder from him, he was filled with exultation and was raising a hymn of joy to God while his mouth was full of laughter and exultation. When it happened that they amputated one of his, uh, his inferior limbs, which was the knee, in this limb he suffered. And when they asked him why, he told them something which is true. You should know that when you were amputating all of my other limbs, I was not suffering, and my mind was wholly in heaven. But for this limb, I was allowed to suffer, so that I might know that I am a human being. There is a pseudo-Makarian background uh, to this uh, affirmation. I cannot focus on this now, but maybe in the discussion we can uh, uh, talk us about this uh, inference. So Isaac basically is saying here that only an experience of suffering can make us aware to be human. So this is the dynamic that he's describing here, and uh, you will recognize in this dynamic something which is already in Paul, especially in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, 10, but is found everywhere in Paul's corpus, but of course the main passage is this one, is the passage concerning the thorn in the flesh, and I want to read it with you. So that I might not boast of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn was given me in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me so that I might not be exalted. Concerning this, I asked the Lord three times that it might depart from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is accomplished in weakness. Here Paul does not use uh, machiluta. That is the term that Isaac most often uses, but use krihuta. But krihuta, uh, Paul, of course, Paul. I want to say the translation of the peshita that Isaac read. So the Syriac translate um, the Greek with this krihuta. 
And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, this term is present in Isaac. So we find Krihuta, we find uh, other terms. So this passage is really um, behind Isaac reflections. And Isaac also stated uh, one time openly commenting this passage uh, for um, um, one homily. So actually, I am a human being, and I, I know this because I suffer. So suffering makes one aware of one's human condition of weakness. And uh, uh, the turn of Paul, therefore, corresponds to the experience of suffering. And this knowledge of through suffering is not only mental, but it is experiential because it, it involves one body and soul, flesh and blood. In fact, uh, Isaac traces detailed phenomenologies of this experience and uh, uh, in all of them, he insists on the concept of knowledge of weakness, idaita de mechiluta, knowledge or awareness, because in Syriac, uh, uh, this is, does not refer to intellectual knowledge alone, but also to experiential knowledge. And this is particularly, um, we can see this uh, particularly in a passage where Isaac puts together the verb to know, ida, and the verb to perceive, argesh. And this verb, argesh, it's really the verb of also physical perception. Let's read this passage. Blessed is the person who has known his weakness, mechiluta. This knowledge will be for him the foundation and beginning of all good and beautiful things. When a person has known and perceived that precisely in the truth he is weak, then he restrains himself from scattering, which is the dispersion of knowledge and increases his watchfulness over his soul. But he, if uh, he is not allowed to be a little imperfect, if a small act of negligence does not occur to him, or if the tempers do not surround him with the pains of the body and the suffering of the soul, a person cannot perceive his weakness, again, Argesh. So basically, we see here that if there is imperfection, negligence, the tempers, the pains of the body, the suffering of the soul. All this makes one aware of his weakness. And of this pe person, Isaac says, this person is blessed. But how does it work? Why it is so? So actually, Isaac conceives as the solitary journey, which traditionally is structured in uh, uh, an ascetic moment and in a contemplative moment, uh, as uh, uh, a way of deciphering this blessedness, let's say. In fact, uh, the ascetic journey and the solitary life is conceived as an initiatory process, as a, um, a mysterious place of transformation. He says, for instance, that the honorable practice of stillness is a haven of mysteries. The cell is the cave of hard rock, or the cleft in the rock, where God spoke with Moses, that's Exodus. The solitary life is the furnace of Babylon, Daniel, where one is tried like gold. So from this being tried like gold, something can emerge. And this, for, for instance, uh, for Isaac, is the contemplative uh, opening, the contemplative openness that can emerge. But uh, we would mistake Isaac if we would think that it's uh, suffering per se that has a value. Suffering has a value because it teaches the person, if the person listens, a relationship with him or herself. And in this sense, there is a passage of Isaac that I find particularly telling, although um, it's made of images, so it's not theoretic. What uh, I'm going to argue that he says is not theoretically or openly expressed. But uh, uh, I believe it's very telling. Here Isaac speaks, uh, uh, inspired by the image of the pearl diver, who was, uh, uh, Isaac came from the coast. So we know that uh, metaphors related to the sea or to swimming and to diving were familiar to him, coming from everyday life. He speaks of the pearl diver as somebody who encounters difficulties, and these difficulties uh, teach him to swim, teach him to dive. Let's see. Isaac speaks of a noetic swimming of the intellect, of descending to the earth of the heart, uh, sorry, to the heart of the earth, 
unlike to make the body's movements dive down to deep places in which it is, it is not easy for everybody to swim. He speaks of profound depths in which our fathers swam, of descending to the abyss, which old reaches, descent into the abyss. He speaks of waves assailing the person, of marine beasts encountering him. He speaks of holding the breath up to death, of deprivation of clear air. He speaks of a fearful sea, and he calls the solitary life the rough sea of stillness. And he also says, if a diver found a pearl in every oyster, everyone would easily become rich. If he brought a pearl up as soon as he dived, pearls would be more frequent and numerous than pebbles. So you can see how all these difficulties that the diver encounters teach him how to swim, how to dive in order to find the pearl. Um, and uh, uh, Isaac has a strong awareness that uh, uh, the difficulties that one encounters are real difficulties. For instance, uh, he speaks of difficult precipices that one encounters in the journey, of appearances of truths that are frequently found on the paths. And you can see uh, in the first page, if we go a bit, uh, uh, we come back to the first page, how rich is the vocabulary of uh, related to suffering in his corpus, how rich and uh, detailed. So he has a strong awareness of how dangerous is this diving. And for this reason, he outlines uh, the need uh, of being in a relationship of trust with a spiritual guide who guides the person in this journey. He says uh, that you need an enlight for an enlightened man who is experienced in these things so that one might be enlightened and comforted by him from time to time. Then he adds, not all the time, however. So one should also do <laughs> something alone. But uh, uh, this insistence on the need uh, to be guided uh, of a relationship of trust indicates how difficult is the journey. So he is really aware of this. Within this journey, Isaac uh, is um, inspired by several sources. One, for instance, is Evagrius, who speaks of abandonment, Meshtab uh, Kanuta in Syriac. The soul can be abandoned for a pedagogical reason by God. Then we have Pseudomacarius, the Syriac Pseudomacarius that he inherits, where Macarius speaks of the changes uh, between good and bad experiences, shuklate, and these changes are interpreted as uh, the atmospheric, uh, the, the, the changes in the weather, basically. And one should need to be in relationship, as I said before, with these uh, different uh, um, experiences. Um, we have other elements, um, of course, that uh, indicates this uh, process of relationship, but I believe that the main uh, um, element which really connotes Isaac thought concerning this process is what I called uh, often bearing. And I call it bearing because Isaac himself uses often a vocabulary related to, uh, to bear. Uh, in particular, he, he uses ten and sebal, which means to bear, but then he has several other terms, saibar, to endure, hamsen, to all fast and persevere, mersai branuta, endurance, patient endurance, etc. But uh, we don't have to think that it's only a matter of resistance or endurance. Because, in fact, Isaac uses ten and sebal, which means to bear. In particular, ten means to bear a burden, so to put yourself below in order to sustain this burden. And he also speaks uh, of remaining, using the, the verb kuaf, to abide or to remain. What I um, want to highlight, showing you this uh, diverse vocabulary, is that Isaac uh, uh, conceives bearing as uh, the fact of sustaining a weight, remaining in contact with something firm and stable, while perceiving this something. So we can interpret this also as a way of uh, uh, finding a relationship with this something, and this something is precisely the experience of the negative. So you put yourself 
under something to bear its weight, perceiving it, and stay. And this staying, in fact, is uh, often expressed by the idea of sitting in the cell. That's a, a traditional idea in monasticism. It's not an invention of Isaac, but he speaks, for instance, of a perseverant sitting in the cell. So while you sit in the cell, everything can happen, but you remain firm. So the cell becomes like a symbol of this remaining, a symbol of this um, inhabiting a condition of uh, uh, also negation and negativity. Um, I use the term inhabit here. Um, this term is often used in the sciences related to phenomen phenomenology uh, in the previous century. In particular, I find the use also in a psychoanalyst and philosopher, Pessina, um, who um, conceives the fact of inhabiting um, speaks of a regressing consciously toward the unconscious in order to uh, find its secret, assume its secret, without uh, uh, triumphing of this dimension or removing this dimension, so staying there. Of course, Isa's context is another context, but I find uh, interesting resonances also in this, in this conception. And uh, uh, concerning this, um, let's read together some uh, uh, very important passages in which Isaac defines as perfect practice of God the fact of dwelling there in contact with also negative and contradictory experiences, especially the passions. The human being who does not receive on himself rejoicing in them, heaviness, sloth, listlessness in the office, in order to bear their difficulties with gladness and suffocation and darkness and the rest of the griefs of the cell as necessary for the perfect practice of God, but desires complete deliverance from them, he's handed over to the spirit of fornication. And again, believe me, my brothers, listlessness, dejection, heaviness of the limbs, tumult and confusion of the mind, and the other sad things which are allowed to occur to ascetics where they sit in stillness are the perfect practice of God. Do not think that luminosity in the office, cleanliness of mind, delight, exaltation of the art, and limpid converse with God alone are divine practice. I speak truly and according to my conscience, the thoughts of blasphemy, vainglory, and the hateful movements of fornication, also this, is reckoned to be a pure sacrifice and a holy and divine practice, except for pride alone. Because the person perseveres in the struggle of the Lord in all things, those of the right and those of the left. So basically, here Isaac is describing a specific position of the subject, who is in contact with all this negativity, stays there without uh, uh, trying to cancel this experience. So what is the perfect practice of God is not the passion in itself, but it is the subjective attitude before this passion, this attitude of remaining uh, strong and firm bef before this. And uh, uh, within this experience, actually, um, for Isaac, a transformation can become possible. Isaac, for instance, says, if there is a some, someone who reckons as being outside the past, and errors, listlessness, darkness, and the confusion of the mind, and teaches and announces to you a single order full of joy, know that, know that he leads you out of the path of God, and he wants to hand you over to the error of the demons. So basically, if you just look, that's the thought of Isaac, for luminosity, cleanliness of mind, and these elements, you are not loyal to the reality of life. There is also this other side in life. And if you look for God, and if you look also for a human truth, we could say, you have to deal also with this. But there is an experience um, that Isaac calls darkness, Antana, Peak Darkness, Eshuka, Eshka, which challenges this perspective. This uh, uh, experience that Isaac calls uh, darkness is uh, an experience of extreme dejection, 
where uh, every consolation of faith, that's the um, specific phrase he uses, mm -hmm. is utterly effaced from the soul. So you cannot feel your God anymore, but you can also um, not feeling the reason behind your choice, of course, because you don't feel anymore that possibility of liberation of suffering we saw at the beginning. So it's a condition of utter dejection, and Isaac describes it in these terms. Our soul is suffocated, as, and it is as though amidst the waves. If a person draws near to scripture, to the office, or to all he approaches, he receives darkness upon darkness, and he leaves it aside. How many times he is not even allowed to approach these things? He cannot believe at all that he will again receive a change and be at peace. This hour, and hour here, it's a reference uh, that is also more direct in Isaac, to the hour of Gethsemane, so the dark hour of Gethsemane. So this hour is full of desperation, Pesach Sabra, and fear. Hoping God and the consolation of faith are completely effaced from the soul, and the soul is utterly filled with doubt and fear. Mighty blasphemy is also joined to this, and sometimes also uncertainty concerning the resurrection. Frequently have we experienced all of these things, and we have written them down for the consolation of many. So actually, um, this condition implies a loss of the meaning of one's choice, the meaning of one's life, and Isaac uh, uh, synthesized this as a specific suggestion that Satan da, uh, suggests that you can find uh, in the following quotation. The entire concern of Satan is this, to persuade the person that God does not care about him. And again, by those who lie in ambush and shoot their arrows in darkness, who are the demons, it is continuously suggested he will not be happy at all times if he trusts God. And God does not care about you, as you suppose. So Isaac here is very explicit. So what is the problem in this condition of darkness is not a theoretical doubt concerning the nature of God or the attributes of God, but it's a doubt about his care, his providential care for the subject. So you see how this has an existential uh, weight, in a way, and can uh, lead one to question the whole journey of his life, his or her life. For Isaac, in particular, uh, this um, it's also an, a trial of faith, as we saw before, consolation of faith is effaced, and uh, uh, Isaac calls it noetic genna, or sheol. But as a cause, noetic power instead a new form of faith that can be discovered. In Isaac, we find two um, ways of speaking of faith. Um, this is something that he inherits from Mark the Monk, who also speaks of these two faiths. One is the faith Taudita, which means uh, the compassion of faith, that for Isaac is extremely important, but has not the same role of the faith uh, Tuklana. And the faith to Klana is, is the faith trust. To Klana means trust. And so uh, Isaac says that only the faith uh, to Klana can really be a solution to this noetic gain. The faith that dissipates fear, in fact, is not that faith which is the foundation of the confession of the Christian community, but that noetic power which sustains the heart through the light of the mind and through the testimony of conscience, steers in the soul a great trust in God. For him, of course, there is no contradiction between the two. It's like uh, one is within the other, right? So you have to access to, one is the true meaning of the other, actually. We could put it in this way. And therefore, the perseverance steeping in the cell would be, will be in this condition of uh, prostration and dejection, the attempt to find back this faith trust. And sometimes this faith trust cannot be found back. So what you have to do is just to remain there in this utter place of lowliness, if you want. 
and something might mysteriously emerge at this point, and this something is precisely this faith and this, at the same time, the contemplative experience of grace. There is a description of this experience, which is born from this very extreme uh, form of uh, bearing, uh, that uh, we can read and, uh, and comment them together. After much converse with the scriptures, continuous supplication and the acknowledgement of his weakness, with his gaze extending, extended unceasingly towards God's grace, following great dejectedness in stillness, from here, little by little, some spaciousness of heart is born in a person, and the germination which gives birth to joy from within, although this has no origin from that person himself, he is aware that his heart is rejoicing, but does not know the reason why, why he does not understand. There is no one who can understand the nature of these things which occur within as a result of God's grace. This alone can be said. Blessed be the person who, out of hope for God's grace, has endured Saibar, the term we found before, has endured the dejectedness, which is a hidden trial of the mind's virtue, and grows. It is like winter's sadness, which causes the hidden seed to grow as it disintegrates under the ground at the harsh changes of the blustery weather. I took here uh, Sebastian Brock's beautiful translation for the last sentence because I really think it gives the idea, uh, the harsh changes of the blustery weather. And the, of course, the image of the hidden seed that grows is John 12, 24, 26. So there is all a constellation of meanings, of evocative meanings in this, uh, in this uh, sentence. So you can see, uh, if, you, if we look at this uh, sentence as a kind of a comment to experience, um, we can see that the person experienced that this transformation, this germination comes from within. So it's, di it's deeply belonging to the subject, but at the same time, it's not a matter of the will. In fact, Isaac speaks of grace. It's not a matter of the will. The person knows that this has no origin from, the, from him or herself. He does not understand how this happened. He does not know the reason why. Nevertheless, this comes at the end of a metabolic process, we can say, but it is grace. So the role of the human being actually is this remaining, this sustaining the weight of experience. And then what is beyond, being beyond that is the mystery and is not up to the human being. And uh, uh, I believe that in this way, uh, we saw how the fact of developing a relationship with one's own finitude and with one's own limitations and weakness can open one uh, up to the vertical dimension and the experience of God in contemplation. But for Isaac, this is not the end, because for Isaac, there is also an attention to openness to human beings and also to other creatures. For instance, we have wonderful uh, uh, passages, cover the sinner, sustain the weak and the distressed with your word, so that the right hand which supports everything might sustain you. Love sinners and reject their words. Do not treat them with contempt because of their faults, lest you might also be tempted by the same. Remember that you share the stink of Adam, and the two are also clothed with this weakness. We see this um, um, ontological solidarity of all human beings in weakness. And I believe it's the perception of this that uh, allows Isaac uh, to write words which are even stronger than the one we read. And we read the last quotation where he uh, expresses this um, quite graphically. What is a merciful art? It is the burning of the heart for the whole creation, for human beings, birds, wild animals, demons, and for all that is. At their remembrance and sight, his eyes let tear, tears fall due to the vehement mercy that is pressing on his heart. For because of his great compassion, his heart is brought low and he cannot bear to hear or observe any damage or small suffering of anything in creation. For this reason, he offers prayers with tears continually, even for irrational animals, 
for the enemies of truth and also for those who harm him and that they might be protected and strengthened. Even for the reptiles, he prays, because of the great compassion that is poured out in his heart without measure in the likeness of God. And this is the God that he encountered precisely through this process of relationship uh, uh, with uh, his weakness. Uh, thank you. I think we can open the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Suka. That was wonderful, so opening our whole world for us. There's a huge amount to explore there. And we'll open the floor to questions. If I might begin with one, one 